Hi, thank you again, everyone, for joining our call. My name is Goia Yang, and I am the California Director of Programs and Policy with the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, CRAC. I'm honored to be the moderator today um, to share the work that CRAC and our communities have been doing to protect healthcare for our Southeast Asian American communities. I'm joined with CRAC's policy associate, Lee Lo, who will be sharing more on CRAC's work and also with Gabriel Garcia, our Boys and Men of Color Coordinator, and Suvan Lee, our Education Policy Associate, who will both be offering technical assistance during the call. Joining us today, uh, we also have two amazing colleagues. We have Mary June Flores, who is the Policy and Legislative Advocate with Health Access California. Um, health Access California is a California statewide health care consumer advocacy coalition advocating for quality and affordable health care for all Californians. We also have Nu Vang on the line with us today. She's the Community Outreach Advocate with the Fresno Center, uh, which is a community-based organization that provides services to the growing Southeast Asian American community in Fresno County, California. Mary June and Nu Vang will be providing the context on the South, uh, excuse me, providing the context on the 2017 repeal attempts on the Affordable Care Act, discuss what their organizations did to stand up and fight back, and also we'll be discussing what is at, at stake for our Southeast Asian community. On behalf of CRAC and our community partners, we thank you all for joining our call today. In order to join us for our Q&A portion by phone later, please enter your unique audio pin, which is displayed on your GoToWebinar control panel. You must enter this pin so that you, we can hear you when you um, are asking your question later. And as we enter our question portion later, we will provide you with more prompts. Um, but in the meantime, please remember to enter your audio, audio pin now. If you feel more comfortable typing in your question, you may also do that by typing in your question or your comments in the chat box window, which can be found at the bottom of your control panel. Please direct the question to the webinar organizers and we'll be sure to ask your questions out loud or we'll also respond to you directly. You are also welcome to send questions to the organizers at any point during the community call. We will prompt you throughout to also remind you to submit questions. On behalf of CRAC and our speakers today, we thank you so much for joining today's important conversation. During our call, we hope to cover the following. First, reviewing and synthesizing past and current efforts made by the Trump administration to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Second, sharing CRAC's findings from the Southeast Asian Americans Protecting Access to Affordable Health Care Comic Card Campaign. And finally, discussing and sharing ideas and resources on what has been done what we can all do to mobilize our communities to protect our families and communities' access to life-saving access. To start us off today, we have Mary June Flores, who is the Policy and Legislative Advocate with Health Access California, to discuss the 2017 ACA repeal attempts and what that meant for California. Mary June? Great, thank you, Goia. Hi everyone, my name is Mary June Flores, or MJ for short. I'm a policy and legislative advocate for Health Access California, and as Gilia mentioned, we are the statewide advocacy coalition advocating for affordable and quality health care for all Californians. I'm happy to provide a brief overview of what we did in California statewide to help fend off the ongoing Trump administration attacks on the Affordable Care Act and also on our public health program. Next slide. So just to provide you a brief overview, California was a leader in implementing the Affordable Care Act because we understood the importance of providing coverage to all of our residents, regardless of immigration status. The Affordable Care Act provided a way for us to lower our then pre-ACA uninsured rate of nearly 20% to now in 2017 to the historic and lowest rate of 6.8%. 
we are very close to universal coverage thanks to the Affordable Care Act, and especially because of the Medicaid or Medi-Cal here in California, the expansion which allowed low-income childless adults to be eligible for the Medi-Cal program. That added nearly 5 million Californians on Medi-Cal, uh, which we now are at close to 14 million Californians on Medi-Cal. That is a third of our state's population. In addition to Medi-Cal expansion, we created the first of the first marketplace in the nation, and in our state, it's called Covered California, which now has 1.4 million members who are able to get federal financial assistance to afford coverage in the commercial private marketplace. And so these are people that are making anywhere between $16,000 to $48,000 annually. And as you know, that's not a lot of money living in a high cost state like California. So the Affordable Care Act provided subsidies to this population of people who would otherwise be priced out of um, coverage due to many instance, many factors such as affordability or before the ACA, people could get denied coverage due to their pre-existing conditions. And a lot of the work that California has done is to codify really strong consumer protections in state law so that we wouldn't be at the whim or we wouldn't be at the mercy of the federal government. Next slide. So that was a real brief overview of what was at stake for California. We have 14 million people on Medicaid. We have 1.4 million receiving federal subsidies towards um, private coverage. We also get enhanced um, Medi-Cal um, rates for those that are now on Medi-Cal and all of that was put at stake when Trump was elected and he made his first commitment to repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, which we know very well last year took many iterations. And as you can see in this slide, there were four main legislative proposals at the federal level that the Trump administration uh, tried to ram through a non-regular session at the congressional level. And so all of these, the American Health Care Act, the Better Care Reconciliation Act, and the last version, which was the worst version of all proposal, was the Graham Cassidy Heller Johnson proposal. All of those proposals would propose massive cuts to our health care system. It would cut and cut and cap Medicaid. And as a, as a consequence, it would leave millions of people uninsured and our healthcare markets will suffer with increased premiums. They would also repeal very important key protections that all of us benefit from. And as you can see in each of these um, main, main elements, the massive cuts to our healthcare system from Graham Cassidy nationally would be a cut of $133 billion a year. California is disproportionately affected by that proposal because of how big our state is and how big um, our Medicaid enrollment numbers are. We would be cut $23 billion a year. And any of these proposals would actually cut and change and lastly reimagine how we view our state and federal partnership. The Medicaid program, as you know, is an entitlement program. Anyone that qualifies for it um, should get Medi-Cal, and these proposal eliminates that entitlement, leaving millions of people uninsured. Next slide. And so given all of these attacks, uh, federally, we've held our ground in California because we are able to do so at the state level and because of our values and commitment to implementing the ACA. These are some of the ways in which we were able to ward off some of the federal action. The cost sharing reductions is a set of subsidies that covered California members received 
Uh, we work with the exchange to create a wraparound program so that these individuals will not be harmed and will not have to pay more out of pocket for care. Uh, we invested more in our marketing and outreach where our own state's exchange budget for marketing was $110 million compared to the national budget of $10 million. Again, this shows California's commitment to outreaching and marketing to a diverse population of people, including the API and Southeast Asian communities um, along the state. We kept our three month long open enrollment period where at the federal level, they cut it in half. Um, and also we made sure that any insurance company that was exiting out of the market uh, would make sure that individuals and patients are able to retain their care until they find appropriate care and a new doctor that could take um, their case. And lastly, in terms of reproductive health um, and contraceptive coverage, California has stood strong in making sure that women have access to important and vital services. And I'll go on um, later on in terms of what we're planning to do next year. So much, Mary Sorry, June, for your, for your insight. Sorry about Sorry the about feedback. Um, insight on the ACA repeal attempt and discussing what that meant for California, especially our most vulnerable communities. Um, and also, you know, thank you to health access for all the work that you all do to ensure that we're protecting our um, our state residents as much as we can. We'll hear more from Mary June later today, as she mentioned, um, to discuss what's at stake today um, and what we can do to fight back. Now we'd like to get a community perspective from New Vang on what a Southeast Asian American community-based organiza organization did to provide education and outreach to our Southeast Asian American community members in Fresno, California, and to understand where the community's response was once they learned about the attacks on the Affordable Health, the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid. New? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, yes, this is New with the Fresno Center, and I'm um, very honored and excited to be here on this call. And so um, just a bit of a background around Fresno Center. We were formerly called uh, Fresno Center for New Americans, and so we serve the Southeast Asian community as well as um, the Spanish-speaking communities and the communities around our neighborhood. And so, um, you know, Back to the presentation here, you know, last year was really, uh, you know, the fight to save health for all. Um, as, uh, you know, Mary Jane uh, mentioned, her presentation was all about the federal tax. Um, and that really trickled down to the narrative here in the Central Valley. And so, um, you know, there were many, um, there was a lot of fear, a lot of stigma, a lot of uncertainties, um, you know, in our communities with last year's fight. And so, um, if you can go next to the next slide. So, you know, um, taking it from, you know, the state, even the federal perspective and, and really, you know, focusing it uh, closer to home here in Fresno, you know, there was so much at stake um, in Fresno County. So about nearly 50% um, or a little bit over 50% of Fresno counties are actually under the Medi-Cal, um, you know, program due to the ACA expansion. So that's about 192,000 um, and 900 residents that, you know, rely on Medi-Cal to be able to receive health services. Um, and that includes also, you know, kids that, you know, are receiving dental care. And um, this year, we recently just had uh, dental care fully restored for adults. Um, besides that, there's, you know, economic uh, damages that would have happened as well. You know, there's a, a major job loss if the you know, ACA were to go away, about nearly 18,000 jobs would be lost and, and that affects, you know, um, Fresno residents as well as their, their families. And of course, the funds that would be taken away from the county um, as well because of the program, you know, $432 million would be lost um, into uh, our county. And so, you know, the county is, um, you know, besides the, the fact that residents would lose access to health care, this major um, dollars that, you know, we would be taking away from our county. And then next slide. 
Okay, so, you know, um, what were we to do, right? So, uh, I, uh, Lee asked, you know, to just really share about, you know, community knowledge on this issue. And so, um, you know, our uh, strategy here in, in the Central Valley is really multiple folds. And so, uh, one way we were doing that was to build community power uh, through policy education. Um, and, and we realized that, you know, residents are eager to, uh, you know, learn the skills to advocate for themselves and, and become leaders. It's just that there's uh, the narrative and and everything that's happening in the policy uh, system is so fast. And so I think they were lacking that piece and we were able to uh, help them with that. The other uh, campaign strategy that we were able to actually uh, um, uh, participate in was the ASA support postcard presentation and campaign and so um, that was another way we were able to leverage uh, resident voices. Uh, we also had multiple press conferences in Fresno um, as well as uh, visiting local elected officials, uh, their offices and their staff members to really bring uh, resident voices. And then, of course, um, you know, reaching out to our ethnic media outlets as well as the mainstream outlets as well. Next slide. So, you know, what did Fresno Center do to uplift community members, right? How did we, how were we able to uh, educate them? And so, um, you know, last year we, and we've been doing this uh, for the past couple of years, is one way that we've been able to do that is, uh, to create a, a program. And so uh, with my partners with Building Healthy Communities here in Fresno, uh, we have been uh, educating, inviting and educating residents at the BHC University. Uh, it's usually a six month program. And with each workshop, we're able to teach them about, you know, what, what does advocacy mean? Um, who, who are your elected officials? Why are they important? And how do you get your voices, you know, and your stories to to their desk and so that's one way that we've been able to do that and if you can see i have one resident there her name is my pong and she's in both uh both pictures and so you know the the other the other way that we're able to really continue that narrative for uh residents is to really create a platform for them to uh tell their stories and so as you can see in the picture to the right um, we had a press conference under, you know, uh, I support Medi-Cal and I will vote sign really to to allow residents to come out and and be there um, to to share their stories. And so my mom was there. Um, she had prepped her story about her need for Medi-Cal uh, and she was on standby to talk to any of the reporters, uh, Fresno B or ABC 30 about her need and and then what's really sad is you know my pong um you know is one of these uh residents where you know uh she got sick on the job she you know and and it, through that and and um a traumatic divorce and you know so many things happen she's you know become disabled and unable to um to work anymore and so she really does rely on you know, Medi-Cal and the benefits there to um, pay for her, you know, um, her prescription and her doctor's visits. And so, um, you know, it's really empowering when you're talking to residents, you know, and hearing their stories on, you know, their journey and and how they really need these type of services. And if there wasn't there, you know, um, they may not be alive. So next slide. Thank you. And so the next phase that, you know, we also did is I, I really wanted to share, um, you know, four of these samples on the postcard campaigns that we did last year as well. We did multiple campaigns um, with our state partners uh, as well as CRAC, um, and then also with our local partners too. Um, you know, understanding the need to really bring those stories, whether it's through residents really sharing it through um, a press conference to them just writing a short note. And so we can pass that to the elected officials when we went to their offices and visited. And so I really wanted to share, um, you know, these uh, four postcards. So you can see as you're reading the ones that are written in English, um, residents come from a variety of backgrounds. And so um, not one, one resident one category fits all of them and so the one that i really wanted to um point out to you is the one that you know to your far far left corner and it's written in Hmong. and and the message just says you know 
And so this is a resident that, you know, um, only speaks English and, and writes English only. And the message that he conveyed is, you know, please, uh, please help provide health access for the, the poor people or the people who are low income. And uh, this is so important for us. And so, um, you know, this, these type of stories and these type of narratives where people come from such a different background um, and, and their needs are, are, you know, met here and, and for that type of risk that, you know, their health uh, coverage will be taken away. It's just, it's so, it's so raw, it's so real. And so um, things like these, we were able to educate um, our residents uh, at the center, we actually have multiple workshops happening every day, whether it's a Zumba class, a yoga class. Um, we have a living well program with uh, therapy one-on-one -on -one and in groups. And so uh, through those type of um, platforms, I was able to present uh, the news about the ACA being threatened to residents and, and asking for their support. And so um, in, in that way, we were able to really be there uh, where the place where they're, they usually all gather together as a community and to really um, take it to the grassroots level. Okay, next. Okay, great. So I, um, I wanted to share this quote with you. Um, I felt like last year was, was really chaotic just because there were so many um, attacks, right? So many bills and so many attempted repeals. And so, um, you know, uh, I kind of included the, you know, uh, quote from Bruce Lee, you know, the full quote is, um, it says, you must be shapeless, firmless like water. When you pour water in a cup, it becomes a cup. And when you pour water in a bottle, it becomes a bottle. When you pour water in a teacup, it becomes a teacup. Water can drip and it can crash. Become like water, my friend. And I think that quote really encompassed my experience last year, uh, working with residents and trying to, um, you know, keep them updated with what was happening um, at the federal level in regards to healthcare. Um, every every day was something new coming from the federal government, and uh, we always had to really be flexible and willing to kind of be meet you know the opposition wherever they were and so um i just wanted to share this quote and and this is um a screenshot of uh an article that um my partners and i um in fresno had done during a press conference and this was really right after the gop failed to um passed a better Recon reconciliation act and really we had actually planned that press conference just to voice out resident opinion about the uh, Reconciliation Act. But, you know, that morning, um, we news broke out that, you know, the act didn't pass. And so, you know, we jumped on that opportunity to really um, share resident stories and then also um, just let our elected officials know that, you know, um, the constituents in our area really needs healthcare and access to it. Okay, next slide. And so, um, in addition, kind of going back to our strategies, uh, we had several uh, legislative visits. Uh, one was to Jim Costa, um, and then the other one, as you can see with the uh, picture on the right, is uh, Representative Valadeo's office. And so, we went there, and um, one of our strategies was to bring postcards to their office. Um, and then uh, our district, um, Fresno Center, is actually in. Um, Jim Costa's uh, district, and so we went to his ACA workshop, and he had a press conference as well, uh, supporting the ACA and, and and being open to trying to figure out if there was a bipartisan uh, solution to this um, this uh, disagreement or just uh, this policy. Okay, next. And of course, um, I did want to focus on also the media campaign that we had here in, in Fresno. And so, um, you know, our strategy to educate the community is not just um, just to uh, the center or just to our, our university and the residents that we work with, but we really wanted to focus on um, making sure that the community uh, knew about what was happening and, you know, how it would affect to the Southeast Asian community uh, as one example. And so um, these are different um, different ways that we were able to um, be in the media. And so uh, the back two pictures are with the Fresno Bee and then ABC 30. Um, we sent press, uh, press statements as well as uh, submitted uh, op-eds. But 
the one picture with me um, there is actually when we're at the ethnic radio uh, station, that's with the Hmong radio station, KBIF 900, um, we were able to host a bilingual show and really uh, just tell people about, you know, the status of the ACA, um, that, you know, it's still active, even though there's been so much news about the repeals and for people to to know that they still need to get um, coverage uh, for the next year. And if there were any updates, we would let them know. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, you know, um, as you guys may all know, the, the fight really, uh, still continues this year. And so um, we will continue to uh, advocate for residents and bring their voices to our elected officials and making sure that, um, you know, their narratives are heard as well. So um, hopefully I answered all the questions. Um, and if you, anybody else has any questions about strategies or uh, resident experiences, um, I am here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, give us one moment as we do a little bit of tech troubleshooting. All right, thank you. We're back. Uh, apologies for that. Thank you again, Neil, for providing Fresno Center's perspective. Oftentimes when our communities haven't felt the direct impact of these attacks, uh, we have to work even more diligently to provide the education and outreach to really increase um, their awareness about these impacts and also really to build their power. So I really appreciate both New and Mary June for providing um, the information. Um, next, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Lilo, uh, who is our CRAC's policy associate, to share more about CRAC's Protect Access to Affordable Care Act Common Car Campaign, what we learned and what we were able to do to advocate to protect access to affordable health care. Lee? Hi. So. CRAC's Common Card campaign was held last year from late April to June, and we collected over 350 comments directly from our Southeast Asian American community, and we partnered with Southeast Asian American-led and serving community-based organizations and individual community members to disseminate and collect common cards. From the comments, we learned how the ACA has impacted the Southeast Asian American community members, provide a platform for them to educate the legislators and demand that these legislators protect access to affordable health care, the ACA and Medicaid expansion. I think what made the common card so successful was because these comments were collected by organizations and in individuals that the community already trust and made advocacy as accessible and convenient for them to contribute. CRAC and community partners eliminated barriers to advocacy and provided an avenue for community members who did not speak English to communicate directly with their legislators by translating and transcribing their comments. It was a really powerful advocacy tool to connect our disenfranchised Southeast Asian American community and their voices to their legislators that have been historically disempowered to engage in politics. The comments were then synthesized into a conclusive re report that we are releasing today for the first time ever. <laughs> and upon analyzing our comments, community members expressed three major benefits they have received from the ACA and Medicaid expansion. Access to affordable health coverage, access to life-saving care, and access to essential health benefits like maternity care and mental health care. And Southeast Asian Americans um, communities have historically faced significant barriers to accessing affordable health insurance. So prior to the ACA, Southeast Asian Americans experienced some of the highest uninsured rates in the nation. Upon implementing the ACA and Medicaid expansion, uninsured rates were cut in half by 2015. The comments directly stated the ACA and Medicaid expansion as expanding their access to affordable health care. With more access to affordable Healthcare. Many um, Southeast Asians have sought healthcare services for chronic conditions or emergencies without having to worry about the cost of seeking care. And 32% of our respondents um, responses directly cited the ACA as a factor in improving or saving the lives of their loved ones. Because the ACA requires essential health benefits to be covered by all health insurance plans, Southeast Asians now have um, greater access to care that's critical for their well-being. Many respondents expressed their gratitude for improved access to health 
to women's health, like maternity, um, prenatal care, contraceptive coverage, and women-specific preventative care. And as a refugee community that experienced war, genocide, and displacement, Southeast Asian Americans have higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health challenges. And through the passage of the ACA and Medicaid expansion, Southeast Asian Americans have had greater access to receive these health care services through the essential health benefits mandate. And through analyzing the comments, CREC make the following policy recommendations. To protect the ACA and Medicaid expansion for Southeast Asian Americans, implement Medicaid expansion in more states to cover currently uninsured Southeast Asian Americans, and invest in understanding Southeast Asian American communities and constituents. Any and every attack on the ACA and Medicaid will risk regressing the progress we have made in making healthcare affordable and accessible for Southeast Asians. And that is why it is so critical to protect this progress and protect the ACA and Medicaid. And because some states have resisted expanding Medicaid, there are many Southeast Asian Americans still struggling to access healthcare in their states. Therefore, CREC insists that states who have not already done so to expand Medicaid to cover our uninsured Southeast Asian Americans who are citizens, lawfully present residents, and undocumented Southeast Asians alike. Southeast Asians face multi-layered barriers to advocate with their legislators. However, it is inexcusable for policymakers to ignore over 3 million people who call the United States home. Therefore, CREC demands that policymakers invest in understanding local Southeast Asian American communities to learn about the local and state specific Southeast Asian American health disparities. And you can access this report. It is available on this webinar under the handout section in the control panel. And it, is also, it will also be emailed to you as a follow up to this webinar and be posted on our website. So rest assured this report will be accessible for you outside of this webinar. How to use this report. Um, this report synthesizes our findings to educate legislators and our community members about what our Southeast Asian American community are saying. And we recognize that there are many stories from many cities and regions that we were not able to collect comments from. And there is an ongoing need to collect stories and hopefully this report can guide, as, um, guide any work that you may be interested in doing in the future. And additionally, CREC created this report as a tool for community members to use to supplement your advocacy, to demonstrate that your narrative is a part of a broader concern, and to demand that your legislators make systemic, systemic policy changes with Southeast Asian Americans in mind. Thank you so much, Lee, for that information. We hope that this report will be useful for you and your organization. And also in addition, knowing that oftentimes there isn't enough data around Southeast Asian Americans. This is also, we saw this as an opportunity for us to really be able to collect the stories and have more data um, and make it available to everyone who's on the line uh, when you're going out there to really fight for access for affordable healthcare. Um, so now we're gonna actually move into taking a really quick poll. Um, and we want to know We want to know that on a scale from one to five, how prepared do you feel to do health advocacy? So if you could go ahead and take about 45 seconds to take the poll and then we'll show you the results. So about 10 more seconds. Okay, and we're gonna close the poll. So it looks like about 10% feel 
not too confident at a two. We have about 50% who feel so-so at a three. And then we have 30% of attendants uh, who feel confident and 10% who feels very confident. So this is a, a really good poll for us as um, everyone on the line is kind of thinking through different campaigns and different advocacy tools that we can make um, available and accessible to you all. Um, so be sure to also take the survey afterwards, uh, which will ask more specific, specific questions around what can the organizations um, on the webinar do to better provide information um, to help you with your advocacy locally and statewide and also on the national level. So we will actually turn it back to Mary June to discuss what's at stake today and what we can do to fight back. But before you start, Mary June, if you just give us a second to get back into the PowerPoint. Give us one minute as we, as we do some troubleshooting. All right. All right, we're back. Mary June? Great. Thank you, Goia. And thank you to New and Lee who affirm the importance in organizing and also the importance in really uplifting the human stories behind the millions of people that benefited from the Affordable Care Act. As New mentioned, uh, our coalition worked really hard across the state to make sure those stories are heard and to make sure that we were able to use everything that we could, both from a grassroots level to media and also to our state and federal level congressional leaders to hold them accountable to what they were about to do last year, which many of them actually, all 14 Republican congressional members of California voted to repeal the ACA um, the two times in the House, and also, uh, luckily, on the Senate side, it failed. And as you know, the Graham-Cassidy proposal failed by one vote, and that was McCain's vote, in addition to Murkowski and Collins from other states. And so there is definitely a lot of work around making sure those Republican California leaders are held accountable to essentially stripping off millions of Californians' coverage. And that's to emphasize that last year, the attacks from the federal government took place both legislatively through those federal proposal and also through the budget proposal that was done by President Trump. And as you know, the recent GOP tax scam proposal that was passed and now in law uh, actually zeroed out an important essential element of the Affordable Care Act, which was the individual mandate penalty. And so now, starting next year, people who refuse to buy coverage will no longer have to pay a penalty, which will dramatically impact our health care insurance market because healthier and younger people will opt out of buying insurance coverage, leaving our sicker, older, more vulnerable population in the insurance market, driving up their costs because they're the only ones that are left buying important coverage that they need because they have ongoing chronic medical conditions. And so that's something that we're really worried about. And similarly from last year, we expect this year both legislative and budget attacks from the federal government. So I think one thing that I would emphasize is um, 
sadly, we have to expect the attacks to be ongoing until we get a new president because, as you've heard on the news, there have been so many ways that the Trump administration have tried to unravel important protections for consumers and also on the Medicaid side, um, allowing his CMS administrator to require work requirements to people who are on Medicaid, uh, which we know is completely problematic because close to 50 to 60 percent of people that are already on Medicaid are actually low-income workers who don't get insurance from their employers. And so it's completely anti uh, our values and it's also illegal to require work requirements to those populations of people. And I would recommend that you all look out to and help the National Health Law Program as they to the federal government on this uh, issue. And just to bring it back for um, this call, last week the Trump administration released their budget blueprint from 20, for 2019. And as you can see, in addition to the tax giveaways that he made uh, from the December tax cut to millionaires and billionaires, he's also proposing to further cut um, our overall federal government budget by $3 trillion. That's in addition to those tax cuts that he had already made, or and it will, and those cuts will transpire in the next um, two to 10 years. And so if you accumulate all those cuts, our important public health, public social programs, and also entitlement programs will be deeply impacted. This slide just focuses on the healthcare side, but um, I would recommend you all go through other resources like the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities that really detail out the impacts on these trillion dollar cuts to um, housing, to um, our CalFresh pro program, to our entitlement programs, and also to many other programs that we benefit from. So on the health side, as you can see, the budget proposes to cut Medicaid and ACA. So this is just on the expansion side um, by $763 billion over 10 years. Uh, on top of cutting the expansion money, um, this proposal incorporates the Graham Cassidy proposal that would eliminate Medicaid expansion and ACA subsidies, meaning it would eliminate expansion after 10 years if this bill would be signed. Um, and lastly, for the core Medicaid program, it would block grant the programs to the state, which means the state would only get a finite amount of funding, regardless of the enrollment numbers that each state has. And as you can see, that's very problematic for California, especially when we go through recessions and when people are more vulnerable because they don't have work, they have to get on Medi-Cal in order to get coverage. And also given our massive uh, enrollment in Medi-Cal, we will be impacted greatly more so than other states. And then lastly, the budget would propose to again weaken important consumer protections like pre-existing conditions, um, maximum out-of-pocket costs, and annual or lifetime benefit limits. And so all that to say, we have to keep vigilant and keep our ongoing uh, organizing and also education of our community because this administration will not stop. It did not stop last year, and it, as you can see this year, it's not stopping as well. Next slide. So this slide um, focuses on what California can do in spite of the federal attacks and also what California can do regardless of whether or not um, at, we need federal approval. And so our coalition, Health Access California, 
uh, have been focused on trying to achieve and work towards universal coverage because as I mentioned before, we only have less than 7% of Californians uninsured. That means we have 93% insured rate and that remaining 7% of uninsured uh, people are mostly undocumented um, individuals who are part of our community. And so that work that we're doing is towards Health for All, as New mentioned. Um, there is a new state legislation introduced by Senator Lara, SB 974, that we are co-sponsoring with the California Immigrant Policy Center to expand Medi-Cal to the remaining uninsured, undocumented, California residents, regardless of immigration, because we think that it's an important step that California needs to take towards universal coverage. Um, there are many other pieces in legislation that Health Access will be sponsoring this year, but that is one of our key component and key legislation that we'll need all of your support in because California has been the first state to expand Medicaid to undocumented kids and that was also through our work with the California Immigrant Policy Center and so we are working towards a universal coverage system we are working towards making sure that our public uh, uh, health care system are accountable uh, we are trying to make sure that they're cost effective and we are trying to make sure that the system is focused on care and prevention prevention and not profit. So I would just um, recommend you all watch out for the legislation that we are running because the legislation we hope will be groundbreaking and make sure that California again is at the leader in implementing and improving upon the ACA. And the next slide. Um, and I mentioned this um, just now in terms of universal universality. Health for all work is ongoing, and these are proposals that we do not need federal approval on. Uh, but we need all of your support in making sure that our state level elected official prioritizes these health. Uh, initiatives that I know that you all care about. And so uh, with that, I would just like to extend um, and also announce that we created a new coalition called the Care for All California Coalition. Um, and we invite you all to join that coalition so that we can work together in finding state level solution amidst a very hostile federal administration because we know that California can get to universal coverage and so that our brothers and sisters and the rest of our community can have access to good quality coverage in California. And next slide just shows um, my contact information and happy to be a resource to any of you and also happy to answer any questions on other legislation and the coalition that we just formed. Thank you so much, Mary June. We were really surprised by the several attacks on healthcare in 2017. And as you mentioned, we know that this is going to be an ongoing attack. And we're really happy for organizations like Health Access California to keep everyone all to date about what's happening and also developing really progressive California statewide policies to address the impact and really to protect our vulnerable communities. We hope that hearing from Mary June and Health Access California can serve as an inspiration to those who are on the line that are outside of the outside of California to really think about um, really effective strategies that you can also implement in your state. So next up, we're going to turn it back to Lee um, to share and discuss CRAC's action plan for 2018 and what you can do to get involved. So while uh, none of these initiatives passed in 2017, we saw that the vote to repeal the ACA was extremely close in both the House and Senate. And with a Republican majority in both House, the most important time to educate your member of Congress is now. 
And even if your representative voted to protect the ACA, it is just as critical to affirm their vote so that they stand firm under pressure because they might just be the critical legislator to save um, or repeal the ACA and Medicaid. Therefore, in 2018, CRAC is focusing our efforts to do targeted accountability advocacy to our Republican representatives that represent large districts of Southeast Asian Americans, holding them accountable for the way they voted in 2017 and how they can vote, in, vote with Southeast Asian Americans in mind in 2018. And with 2018 being an election year, it is essential for us to be educating legislators and candidates about our community. And with an emphasis in, in doing in-district visits with legislators this upcoming year, we will be providing additional advocacy training throughout the year. So what can you do? So I would highly recommend that the first and most simple thing you can do is subscribe to CRAX Listserv. It allows you to stay up to date and informed and allows you to educate community members about the ongoing attacks. And CRAC will continue to produce materials to make educating community members and advocacy about these threats a lot easier for community to digest. And these are these will be great resources for you if you are con continuously interested in doing um, community education. And community work is so important. It is so important to continue educating each other on the attacks to our health care. And this administration will only continue to attack our health care. So it is essential for us to stay vigilant and strategic, like continuing to collect common cards and stories from community members now to send to your representatives during critical votes later. And for example, new from the Fresno Center mentioned that they collected comments last year. Well, they are continuing to collect common, um, collect stories even this year from their residents and welcome anyone who is interested in collecting comments in Fresno as well. And um, that's definitely something that we can do in advance now before um, a lot more attacks come our way. And advocacy. So whether you have capacity to make legislative visits or simply making a phone call or just delivering community comments, it is so important to convey your concerns to your, your representative because you might just be the first Southeast Asian American constituent that they have heard from. And CREC can help provide materials to make these actions easier by providing calling scripts or templates to collect comments. And I highly recommend that if you're interested in doing advocacy and unsure as to where to start, you can always reach out to CREC. We are more than happy to help expand your advocacy capacity. And I also wanted to put a plug for our um, annual leadership advocacy training. Our applications are open and they are closed next week on February 28th. And this is a three-day um, three training based in Washington, D.C., um, covering housing and travel expenses. And I invite any of you interested in building your advocacy to apply and, and attend. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, so we will actually move into our Q&A portion. Um, we know that we had so much we discussed today and uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, but before we get into the Q&A, just a few of our community ground rules for participation. Um, so if you could please respect the points of view that are presented, even if they are different from your own. And also please share your name when you begin. So in order to make a comment or a question by phone, please do the following. If you haven't already, please remember to enter your audio pin found on your control panel. And then um, go ahead and click the raise hand icon to put yourself on the list of the speakers. Uh, to do this, you could look at the far left side of your control panel. You will see an orange arrow as at the top. To let us know that you would like to share a comment, please click on the raise hand icon, which you should see as the fourth icon down from the yellow arrow. We will unmute you and let you know when your line is open for comment. And also please click the raise hand icon to put yourself on the list of speakers. If you're typing in a question, you may do that as well, and, the, and we will direct the questions to the webinar speakers. So this question can go to any of our speakers, um, Mary June, New, or Lee. Uh, 
and the 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 individual wrote this is a long time ago but would someone be able to update on the health equity and accountability act of 2016 Sorry, can you clarify the Health Equity and Accountability Ads? The Health the Equity health and equity Accountability Ads. I'm not sure, is that a state level act or federal level act? Um, the, the, the name of the legislation does not sound familiar to me. So I, I believe the Health Equity um, Accountability Act of 2017 is a bill that they introduce every year just really um, as a basis to um, talk about the different quality of um, the quality of care and the quality of like health care that we would like to receive um, for that's inclusive of communities of color and uh, and um, low income communities as well. And so that's introduced every year, just kind of like setting a basis. Um, it's never with the intention of it actually passing. If anything, it's um, a precedent to really talk about the different um, standards, the, the high standard that we would like to receive our healthcare in. And so I don't actually have the specific of what was passed in the last year as well. And so that I think that's something that we could def definitely follow up with you more in person or um, personally through email as well to give you more information about that as well. Um, and Goya, you had another question? Yes. Um, so again, this question goes to anyone. Um, and the question is, should we only be targeting our congressional representatives when it comes to protecting affordable health care? Or is there value in speaking with our local and state legislators? Hi, this is new. I just wanted to uh, chime in on that question. And so um, I think there's uh, there's value in that um, in our local and state elected officials to really, um, you know, share our stories too. Um, you know, we've been sharing it with, um, you know, our representative here in Fresno, Representative uh, Joaquina Rambola, um, who's also, uh, you know, on the select committee uh, here about universal care, you know, as well. And so um, I think, if anything, it's always good to educate uh, the representatives on what constituents' needs are, even if they're not um, voting on that legislation, uh, because they can um, reach out to the representatives that they're in contact with. Um, I, you know, Actually, I went to a hearing here in Fresno with uh, uh, Rambola as well as another um, representative, and I did ask them, you know, during the public comment section is, you know, um, you are hearing resident stories about health coverage, and if you can, uh, you know, reach out to your federal counterpart to to share what you're hearing and, and voice your concern too. And if anything, you know, um, they do have, you know, the other uh other federal elected officials ears too and so it, it doesn't I, I don't think it would do any damage you know but it would definitely uh, continue on adding to the narrative so yeah I would encourage it Mary June would you like to respond to sure the only thing that I would add to new I completely agree with neuter uh, we should be um, catalyzing at the local and state level our elected officials, but also we need to remember where the vote takes place. So if the vote is taking place in the House of Representatives or in the U.S. Senate, then we need to put all of our efforts for that specific vote on the congressional leaders because they are the ones that will vote on the specific uh, either bill or budget. And so, um, in terms of short-term organizing around a specific vote, I think uh, what we've done in Health Access California is to put pressure on those congressional leaders um, leading up to that vote. Thank you so much. So I noticed that we are past the hour, um, and I want to thank all of our amazing speakers for all the great information. 
on what Trump's administration has been doing to attempt cuts on access to affordable health care for our communities, especially our most vulnerable communities, and what each organization have been doing to really stand up and fight back. And thank you for sharing powerful um, community advocacy and statewide advocacy strategies to mobilize our community and really to stand up. Uh, we hope that this is also an inspiration to callers that are calling from outside of California in terms of what you can do locally and what you can do at the state level as well. Um, so feel free to also reach out to each one of the speakers individually. You have Mary June Flores' contact information, New Bank's contact information, and also Lilo's contact information. Um, and this concludes our community call. Thank you, everyone.